Whereas coming up on uh, February 1st, it starts at 11 in the morning and goes until late in the evening. So keep that in mind. Keep going to call me in prayers. Uh, tonight, 6 o'clock, evening worship, Bible series on Jesus' word regarding prayer. Thursday is uh, Bible study discipleship series, growing our understanding of God's word. February 8th at 6 o'clock, dinner and entertainment. Meat tray, soups, veggie tray, drinks and dessert. Tickets for tickets, $10 a person. And uh, among other things, crafts will, will be there with a chance to listen to crafts also. And I believe as far as announcements, that's all. Okay, opening hymn this morning. Is revive us again. <laughs> Maybe at least they'll wake us up. We praise the Lord God for the Son of God, for Jesus to die in our Lord. Hallelujah, glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, glory, revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for the Spirit of man, who showed us the Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the land that was saved, who was born on our sins and hills and in the Hallelujah, 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 the scripture this morning comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 40. The 40th Psalm, verses 1 through 3. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set me free upon the rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth. Song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to have today to assemble in your house. Father, to sing your praises together on your table and hear your word proclaim. You would be with us just now, Father, that everything we do is to your honor and glory. Father, be with Brother Glenn as we wait to hear what's going on with him. Father, well, we just ask to be your will, whatever it is. Be with us again, Father. Thank you for all the things that you have done for each of us, for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's praise him as celebrate Jesus. <laughs> Thank you. 
that was close to the gospel and church assemblies were not allowed. What could we do? Here is what one church did, as told in a recent issue of Christian's Taming. TCM, which stands for Taking Christ to Millions, is an international training institute in Austria, where theological graduate students from countries in Eastern Europe, Russia, and the Middle East, and Central Asia uh, converge for concentrated study to help reach their people for Christ. One student in the Institute describes how the church he served is one of those closed countries observed the moral suffering each week. The adults meet at an appointed time each week at a restaurant for a meal. They sit at several different tables, but the predetermined leader situates himself so everyone can see him. After everyone has finished the meal, the leader picks up a piece of bread and bows his head in silent prayer. Everyone knows what he's doing, though nothing is said. When he lifts his head, he eats the piece of bread. Others at various tables fall asleep, and then he bows again in silent prayer. Again, he lifts his head and picks up a glass of wine, water, or whatever else he has, and he drinks. Others follow in his manner. No words are spoken. No, no one acknowledges what they've just done. 
But everyone at the table knows that they have just proclaimed the Lord's death. In fact, it's the very reason they gather in a public place to observe the Lord's Supper, to proclaim Jesus' death, even at the risk of being discovered. The student's story draws us into the profound sacredness of the Lord's Supper, that we proclaim our Lord Jesus' death with our Christians around the world, some of them at the risk of their own lives. Yeah. With this in mind, we come to the table, whether in church sanctuary or a public restaurant, and proclaim the Lord's death. Communion him is Lady Tower. <laughs> truly a blessing to be here today. I thank you so very much for letting us live in such a country that we can worship you so freely. My question is, not only to myself, but to you all, how committed am I, how committed am I to you? <coughs> now, I uh, think I can go through the motions on a Sunday morning, and that all that's all I need to get to heaven. Or do I need to be a little more committed to the to you and put you first and foremost in everything I do? Do I need to be 24-7 with you or just an hour or two on Sunday? It's a question that kind of lingers there. We're never under persecution to speak of. You know, we're freely able to come here and worship you. But how committed were you to us? See, you know, an hour into your crucifixion, could you have stopped it and said, that's enough? 
No, you didn't do it that way. You said, I'm in. And I think that's what we need to think about. Because on the day of judgment, I wonder what excuse we're going to be able to give God that we didn't commit to him and to you and put our cares and our troubles at the foot of the cross. As we gather around this time, we're supposed to examine ourselves. So let's do it. Let's truly examine how we've been this last week with you. And let us hope and pray that from here on, we will change. And we will become committed to you in every way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Son, serve to give back to you. So let's take a moment and think about what Jesus did for us on the cross. How he died for our sins, washed us clean as snow, and gave us an opportunity for eternity. So if you give back, give back with an open, loving heart. And Lord, I ask blessing upon this one. Do with it what you want, Lord. Bless it tenfold as may you need it in your world. In your universe, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. <coughs> <coughs> Father, we have a new universe. 
And uh, the two words do go together. They have a common sense. <laughs> Sometimes we, we don't have a lot of that. And I ran across, uh, I didn't realize that uh, common sense passed away. Well, that would be another one. There's actually an obituary for the passing of common sense. It goes like this. It's a, actually a, a satire. It is supposed to be a uh, sarcastic writing uh, to show culture sometimes how stupid they can be. <laughs> but it mildly, okay? But anyway, here's the obituary. Today we mourn the passing of an old friend by the name of Common Sense. Common Sense lived a long life, but died in the United States from heart failure on the brink of the new millennium. No one really knows how old he was, since the birth records were long ago lost in bureaucratic red tape. He selflessly devoted his life to service in schools, hospitals, homes, and helping people get jobs done without fanfare and foolishness. For decades, petty rules, silly laws, frivolous lawsuits held no power over common sense. He was credited with cultivating such valued lessons as to know when to come out of the rain, how many years I was born, or why the bird gets the early work, and that life is not always fair. Common sense lived by simple, sound financial policies, don't spend more than you earn, reliable time-tested parenting strategies, the parents are in charge, not the kids, and also, it is okay to come in second. He was a veteran of the Industrial Revolution, the Great Depression, and the Technological Revolution, Common sense survived cultural and educational trends, including body piercing, whole language, and new math. But his health declined when he became infected with the, if it was only one person, the Griffin virus. In recent decades, his waning strength would prove no match for the ravages of well intentioned but overbearing regulations. He watched in pain as good people became ruled by self seeking lawyers. His health rapidly deteriorated when schools endlessly implemented zero tolerance policy. Maybe you remember some of these cases, for instance, when there was a report of a six year old boy, true story, who was charged with sexual harassment when he kissed a classmate. There was also a teen that was suspended from school for taking a swig of mouthwash after lunch. And you may recall when the teacher was fired for reprimanding an unruly student only. Worse than the condition of common sense. Common sense declined even farther when schools had to get parental consent to give an aspirin to a student, but could not inform the parents when a female student was pregnant or wanted an abortion. And finally, common sense lost its will to live as the Ten Commandments became contraband, churches became businesses, criminals were treated better than the victims, and federal judges stuck their noses in about everything from Boy Scouts to professional sports. And finally, when a woman too stupid realized that a steaming cup of coffee was hot. <laughs> you remember that? I was reading this the other day and I started laughing. Do you remember the lady bought the cup of coffee from McDonald's several years ago? And she sued McDonald's because she spilled it on and burned herself. Because it didn't say, gosh, and hot. And she won. And she won. She won the lawsuit. I heard a lawsuit before that. I was like, reading this and laughing. It's like, oh, common sense. Uh, there was a guy in prison. I think it was Colorado, but I was going to think of it. And he sued the prison. Now, I forget which kind of peanut butter he wanted. It was one or the other. He either wanted smooth or chunky. And uh, But they gave him the other. And he sued the prison because they didn't give him the kind of peanut butter he wanted. And he won the lawsuit. <laughs> hey, Dane. Yes. The rest of the McDonald's story, she got nothing. Oh, did she get nothing? Because okay. they proved through film. She put the coffee up on the dashboard. That's right. Her grandson was driving and he was mad because he had to stop at McDonald's and he sped out uh, and it came back on. Wow. So I guess common sense. Uh, you know. Well, at the end, common sense, as Paul Harvey said, the rest of the story. <laughs> I'm going to check in on that peanut butter story, see how that one turned out. But we did get some of it. Anyways, wow. At the end, though, common sense drifted in and out of logic, but was kept informed of developments regarding questionable regulations such as those low flow toilets, rocking chairs, and step ladders. I haven't heard about that one. Common sense, by the way, was preceded in death by his parents' truth and trust, by his wife, 
discretion, his daughter, responsibility, his son, reason, and he survived by two step brothers. The first one, his name is My Rights, and the second one is I'm a Whiner. <laughs> so, that would be a stepsister, wouldn't it? I'm a Fred, I'm a Whiner. But anyway, not many attended his funeral. Did any of you know? Careful way to handle that, uh, because uh, so few realize he had passed away. <laughs> It's kind of a human, it's a satire to poke fun at society for how foolish they can become. And in a lot of ways, it's like we've lost sense, common sense. As I said, common. Now, kids are here this morning, and we do have some kids with us. Are there any kids that have a common name? Same last name. Doesn't matter how old you are. We got two on the front row here. Same last name, right? Like, actually, we have three on the front row also that have the same last name. Right? Anybody else now? Um, we have two over here that have the same last name, right? Gregory, right? Common. It's a common name. Relating to a community, common it can refer to something that occurs frequently. You say, well, that's a common, it happens, it's a common thing to happen. It's, it's the norm, not the exception. But then when we put the word sense with it, we're talking about rationale, rationality, having an understanding. And in the book of Job, chapter 28, the Bible tells us. Where true understanding resides, the source of true understanding. Job chapter 28, I direct your attention to this passage of scripture that was read some 30 years ago in the St. Louis classroom to a group of parents when the parents came and asked the teacher, What will your philosophy of education be for our child? And the teacher, as he met with the, the, the parents on that Monday evening in 1990, around 7 p.m., he introduced himself, he welcomed them. And then he said, here is the platform that I intend to use for teaching your children this year whatever subject they may have, whether it's a Bible class, a math class, a history class, an English class, a literature class, a poetry class, a spelling class, phys ed, PE, lunch, you name it. And I read this scripture to them, Job 28, verse 20. And I believe I'll be the platform for our wisdom and our common sense in the church, in life, in our home. And if we would apply this in our life, we would have a so much better society, beginning with ourselves. Where then, from where then does wisdom come? Where is the place of understanding? Thus it is hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the sky. Abaddon and death say, with our ears we've heard a report of it, God understands its way, and he knows its place. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When he imparted weight to the wind at the atmospheric pressure, I think I put that in there for them, we'll be teaching that in science class, weight to the wind, he meted out the waters by measure. When he set a limit for the rain, we'll be talking about that in meteorology class, and a course for the thunderbolt. Then he saw it and declared it, he established it, and also searched it out. And to man he said, let's read it together, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Common sense. Now, I used to revolt against that word, because I would think, well, we're not supposed to live by common sense. We're supposed to live by biblical teaching and biblical standards. But if there was one king in the Old Testament, if I were to ask you to choose one king of all the kings that would probably be at the top of the top of the list of a king who had common sense, wisdom, who would you choose? King Solomon, right? And in 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 16 through 28, there were two prostitutes. Each of them had a child. As I read this the other day, I thought, I learned something. I didn't realize they were both prostitutes. But they both had a baby. I always heard the story of these two women. They both had a baby, and in the night, one of the babies died. And in the morning, the, the one woman woke up, and here's a dead baby in her arms. And then she realized it wasn't her baby. And she, she accused the other woman of taking her baby and switching the babies in the night. So they went to the king. And what I learned is they reviewed that passage. They both prostitutes. I'm just saying we can always learn something Right, you follow what I'm saying? Mind open to the teaching of the Word of God. And so they come before King Solomon, 
And the woman, one woman says, that living baby over there, that's my baby. And the one, the one that was holding the, the live baby said, no, that, that dead baby in her arms, that's her baby. And they were arguing back and forth, and there was no way to prove it wasn't something to do. He said, well, let's just cut the child in two, and we'll give you each half the baby. And the woman, one woman said, no, let the baby live. Give it to her. The other woman said, no, kill the baby. You're not going to have any part of it. And Solomon knew immediately who the real mother was. And the wisdom of Solomon. Common sense. I don't know if I thought of that, but I remember I had read that about 30 some years ago. I believe it was Sasha and Jed, and you can check with them just to verify this, Sam, but uh, they were arguing over a toy. It's mine! It's mine! And it was a no, it's mine! And I came in and I didn't know whose toy it was, so I thought I would use the wisdom of Saul. I said, well, just break it to them. And they both said, go ahead. <laughs> so it doesn't work with toys. But it did here. It did there. It did there with Saul. Jesus himself, did he have common sense? Well, he'd be the top of all kings, right? Just cut to the chase. In John 2, verse 24, that talks about the people. The Bible says he did not commit himself to anyone because he knew all men. Some versions imply he knew, he knows what's in the heart of men. The Bible said the better trust the Lord than trust the man. Jesus put that in practice with that common sense. So has there been a loss of common sense in the culture in which you live? Have you ever been asked, what were you thinking? <laughs> and I would just have to look back at my dad and say, obviously it wasn't. <laughs> And many times I was not. Here are some things I've listed. I'll try to keep moving on them. I, I won't belabor you with them all. Actually, I will. Ironically, it's a list of ten. I believe we've lost a sense of urgency, the common sense of urgency, because life. And if I was, if I, I was going to have something out on your paper, and I apologize, I was going to actually do that for you this week, and I didn't, I didn't get that done. I was going to say, life is, and then I was going to have a white line. Life is. Sense of urgency. Life is short. I mean, you know that. Life is short. Bible says in the book of Psalms, teach us the number of days that we can apply our hearts to wisdom and present you a heart of wisdom. James says our life is like a vapor from here today to run tomorrow. But the Bible says a thousand years like a day, a day is like a thousand years. Where did 2019 go? Do you remember when it turned 2000? I was watching a movie the other day with Fred Thompson. Uh, and I really admired Fred Thompson. He passed away a few years of cancer. By the way, he's raised in church press. I don't like Google that. Sort of he did not attend regularly, but he was raised in the church press. But I thought, what do I like him? Because he had, he had common sense ideas, even in politics. <coughs> he was on this movie. And I thought, you know, he just put that film out a couple years ago. 1994. <laughs> Does it seem possible that 1994 is now what's on? I said 25 years ago, and Pesco goes, ah, it's 2020 now, 26 years ago. Time to life is short. Number two, have we lost a sense of destiny? There used to be a time when people knew that when you die, you go to one of how many places? We're only going one of two places. Either we're going to go to heaven or we're going to go to hell. Only, and that's going to be blank line, blank places. Only two places and the destination is blank line set. The destination is forever set. Heaven or hell, forever. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. We witnessed the birth of a little baby boy on January 6th. And his parents are godly parents, seeking to raise him in the way of the Lord. They say they're perfect parents. But I believe little he lived, but they raised him in the way of the Lord. Now I'm looking forward one day to be in heaven with Leland and Billy and Lincoln and Candy and Macy and all the other my children, grandchildren. I hope, right, providing that they prepare properly for that. And I went to the hospital the other day for a friend of ours who had a baby. And right now, I don't know that they're being raised in the way of the Lord. And as I saw that little baby, that weighed almost 10 pounds, but they got birth, Macy, whew, whew, yeah, it was actually nine pounds, two ounces, I believe. Uh, I said, my, my, he must have been walking when he was born. <laughs> and, we, you know, and then the IV thing went up, beep, 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 and I dismissed myself. But as I left, I thought, where will that child be in eternity? Where will 
their parents would be. And I think we've lost the sense of urgency because life is short. We've lost the sense of destiny, heaven or hell. And maybe if we would restore that common sense, see common, common, you follow common like a common thing. If we have that, we have as a group of believers, every one of us has this common. It's not just a preacher, just a few members, but everybody has a common belief and understanding. It's either heaven or hell. Maybe, just maybe, we would have that sense of urgency again of reaching others because number three, because of the value of a person, the sense of value. Have you ever seen science advertising uh, that they say something like, we provide cradle to grave services? Have you ever seen that cradle to grave? I believe that the value of a person's life extends before the cradle and beyond the grave. Because in Jeremiah chapter 1 and 5, God says to Jeremiah, before you were formed in the womb, I knew you. Now that is mind-boggling to me. Have you ever heard the expression that we existed in the mind of God before we were conceived in the womb? That's where that idea comes. It's not worded that way exactly, Goldie, okay? It's like the closer you get to God, the other you are, right? But to exist in the mind of God, I've heard that phrase. I think it happened. Okay, it already did so. Water under the bridge. We have value from before we were ever conceived in the womb because God knew us. That's where our identity is. So when, when someone asks you, who are you? Well, I'm a preacher. Yeah, but if you weren't a preacher, who are you? Well, I'm, I'm from Hope Well, but if you weren't from Hope who are you? Well, I'm a husband, I'm a father. Yeah, but who are you if you didn't have a wife? God forbid if you would lose your wife or lose your children, like Job did, except he didn't lose his wife. But who are you? And eventually, you got I'm a Christian, and, and there's where your identity is. I'm a Christian. I'm a child of God. I belong to the one who knew me before I was conceived in the womb. I belong to the one who had plans for me before I was born. I belong to the one who had all these days ordained for me, as yet before there were any of them. I, I belong to God, the one whose thoughts toward me, the psalmist said in Psalm 139, are so precious that if we were to try to count up all the thoughts that God has toward us, we wouldn't be able to count them. They would be as many as the, the sand on the shore. If you just have a jar of sand, have you ever tried to count the granules in just a jar? Can you imagine counting all the granules of sand of all the oceans of all the world? And the psalmist says in Psalm 139, all precious are your thoughts to me if I should count them. They would outnumber the same. God, God, that's where I find my identity. How about you? The value of a person. I'm the story. I'm the story. True value. The true value. They still have those. I think it's one of them, Carol. True value. The sense of the value of a person who's created the image of God. Genesis 1 26. And the thoughts of God are so precious that we couldn't count them all. Psalm 139, 17 and 18. And even in Psalm chapter 116. Verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his God in us. I walked in this morning and I purposely put my leather jacket on the far side of the, the aisle of there because my leather jacket looks exactly like Rich Case's leather jacket, leather jacket. I didn't want him to walk out with mine and I don't want to walk out with his. And I remember the first Sunday John Knight became the church. He accidentally went home with Jeff Kimball's, I think, leather jacket. He said, great, the first time I ever go to church, I ended up stealing something. <laughs> John Knight became the Lord, was baptized in Christ. He went home to be with the Lord on May 25th. I don't remember the year, it was my daughter's birthday. And the Bible said, you know, you celebrate birthdays. You celebrate birthdays. Oh, it's your birthday. But yet, Psalm chapter 116, verse 15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of the God of us. The Bible says for the Christian, the day of our death is better than the day of our birth. Did you know that? The Bible says that. That's how valuable we are. Because when Jesus prayed for God the night before he died, he prayed in John 17, 24, Father, I pray that those who may be given to be with me. Jesus' number one desire was not that he would escape the pain of the cross. His number one desire is that he would be true to the pain of the cross, the suffering and the shame, as he offered himself a sacrifice for us. Because his number one desire was that we would receive that gift that he gave us on the cross so that we could be with him forever. That is really True value. And as I said, that's why I believe our value extends before the cradle and beyond the grave. And when we understand the value of a sinner in the eyes of God, 
then perhaps, I hope not just perhaps, but we will truly have the common sense, in other words, the common, everybody with the same mindset, that we will share with them the good news. Stop casting a judgmental glance and start extending a helping hand. You follow? As we share the good news in Jesus Christ. But for too many, I'm afraid, that's outside their comfort zone. And how many of you know that if the cost for something that you really want, you know, well, I really would like to have this, I really want that. But if the cost is too great, how many of you realize it? Then the dream for having it dies. You follow? And sometimes just stepping outside of our comfort zone is a cost that's too great. And so the dream, the passion for winning that person or even sharing the gospel with them, it dies in its cradle because we stay in our comfort zone, we keep our mouths shut. And so don't let, don't let that happen anymore. Understand the true value of a person is somebody that stepped out of their comfort zone to share Christ with you. And boy, we can sure thank God for that. By the way, that's number nine on my list. Thankfulness, gratitude. Did you know that the common sense of gratitude, thankfulness, is vital to go to heaven? Do you know that when you think of people that have fallen away from the Lord, the Bible says the first sign of apostasy, the first telltale symptom of a person falling away from God is when they become unthankful. So just listen, listen to people. Watch yourself when you start. I notice myself, I get ungrateful. And, and, and I was a little ungrateful yesterday morning before that accident occurred. I was coming up the road around 9 or 10 o'clock. The roads were horrendous. They were terrible. And uh, I'm sure they're overworked. I was being critical. I openly confess it. In my mind, I'm thinking, these roads are terrible. And then I thought, if I lose control, they're going to write me a citation for failure to control. And I remember when I lost control the last time and wrecked my vehicle totally, I had to pay a ticket for failure to control. And I'm thinking, well, if you had, had fallen on the road, they would have lost control. Well, I didn't do anything. So here I am coming around the curb toward the country store. And I'm thinking to myself, if I lose control, I am not paying that ticket. <laughs> right then the car came by me. <laughs> Car came by me, and I just thought I moved over a little more to the right. I moved really slow, and my back tire went off the side of the road. The car started to miss. <laughs> I was like, okay, so I'm sorry I said that for you. <laughs> the car back in control. And then here later, that car is totaled, and as Margaret said, a miracle. And then you see a picture of that baby when God has done his good, you know. So don't lose the con don't lose the sense of gratitude. Stay thankful. Stay thankful. Uh, quickly, uh, how about? Truth. Have we lost the sense of truth? If you're in a discussion with me or someone else, just pick the topic. Just pick any topic from the Bible where there might be a disagreement. And you have a disagreement with somebody, and you know how it is. You feel stronger about you feel strongly about talking about it, debating it. How do I know if I honor truth? Here's how I know. If I'm more concerned about what the Bible teaches than I am about winning the argument, then I'm okay. But if I'm more concerned about winning the argument than about what the Bible actually teaches, then I'm not okay. So be careful where you're at there. Make sure that we really want to know what the Bible teaches and follow that on our God. The sense of family. I saw him the other night out by a preacher down He went down south for a revival. If you can picture this, he, his good friend was preaching down in North Carolina. Yes, it is seven after. I saw somebody look at their clock. I won't be much longer, okay? <laughs> Not judging you. I, I just want to let you know I'm aware of the time. Uh, <laughs> he wasn't even <laughs> probably nine on the clock, is it? I'm just throwing that up for Sense of family, that's no one. Sense of having some fun, that's what I put on there. I just threw it out there. I don't even think you were looking at your clock, were you? Uh, okay, but it's better than doing this, right? <laughs> I am aware of the time. But we didn't start until 7 after 10, but I want, I want to wind things down. I want to close with this. I've got a sense of family. I am so excited for the church here because of the sense of family. I think it's horrible for any kind of talk about that, right? So that's what drew them back when they came in. And a lot of people, they're not hungry, a lot of people, you know, they're shy. I've heard people say that 
meet and greet can scare them. You know, I've done the research, I've read the, 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 the statistics out there, and they said, well, some people will never come back if you do. But it seems to me more people were drawn to family than, than uh, being drawn to somebody who's not. You know, and Christian Chapman, who, who is a preacher, uh, was telling this story. He went down to North Carolina. His buddy was preaching at this church. And so he, Christian Chapman, his name's Christian, by the way, he went to preach his revival. When he got there Sunday morning, his minister friend had just learned that he was being fired from the church. And so Christian, the way he tells me, he says, I walked into the church here. We're supposed to have a revival. Everybody's supposed to be happy. And the whole church, half of them were fighting. They're all fighting with each other. And man, half of them wanted to preach. They didn't know what was going on. There was nothing but confusion. There was anger. And he said, it was not a good week for revival. He said, but anyway, we got through the Sunday morning service. And he said, nobody asked me out for dinner. He said, it was fine with me. Because they're all fighting with each other anyway. He says, so I went down to the bar. And had lunch. <laughs> And I guess they had the Indianapolis 500 on or something, you know. And, and you know how, I, well, maybe you don't, I don't. <laughs> I started to say, you know how it is at the bar. And you said, yes, we do. really do. <laughs> anyway, <yeah. laughs> he calls his wife. And she can hear, you know, if you ever, you ever been in the bar? Or is it, it's loud, I guess. And it, 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 everybody's talking. And she can hear all this noise in the background. And she goes, where are you? He said, I'm down below the bar. She goes, what? <laughs> he says, honey, he said, at least down here they love each other and have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> and we wonder why, you know, we walked to some churches, and there's like that church in North Carolina, and they wonder why they weren't growing in them. Why they were about to close, and we follow them. Okay, anyway. Last one. Amen. Amen. <laughs> we're crazy. Crazy in love, right? With each other. Sense of family. Can't imagine being anywhere else this morning. Number 10 on my list, among the others I listed, the sense of victory. The sense of victory. And I was thinking of the children of Israel. When they went in to spy out what was called the promised land. They'd been in Egypt for 400 some years as slaves. Now they've been released, they're free, like we're free. God says, look, I've got something, I've got something special for you. I've got a special land for you. It's, it's all prepared. All you have to do is go in and take it. Do you remember, uh, you may have an out, but in the book of Numbers, chapter 13, when they came back and spying out the land, God, God had sent in Joshua, uh, Moses, Joshua. But they sent in, Moses sent in 12 spies. Joshua and Caleb were two of them, there were ten others. Do you, why do you suppose we always remember the names Joshua and Caleb, but not the other ten? The other ten are listed. I don't remember their name. Partly, I'm not interested in following those other ten. The other ten, all they could see was the giants and how big the giants were. But Joshua and Caleb, all they could see was how big God was. They had a common sense of victory. Just the two of them. But because of the rest of the children of Israel, would not buy in to the victory that God would provide. Remember what happened? <coughs> Those spies, and everyone 20 years old and upward, were forbidden to be able to enter into the promised land. They wandered for how long? 40 years. Terrible price to pay. Along the way, Moses got in trouble too. Moses would go to heaven. I don't know about the other unbelievers. Hopefully they did. But 40 years wasted. Because all they could see was the size of the giants rather than the size of their God. I invite you to focus on the size of your God this week and find your identity in Him. And you ask yourself, who am I really? I hope you can say you're a child of the king. If you can't say that, you can if you accept it, if you obey Him. Surrender to him in baptism so he can truly be Lord. And then walk the rest of your life living for him. So the day you die, the day of your death will come. The day of your death will come. Will you be with God? Will you be lost? Look at my God, not the giants. Let's stay, let's stay.
Thank you. 